How many came to magnify Jesus? One, two, one, two.
You know what, if you're even thinking that I came this morning and I'm supposed to do this on Sunday morning, you're out of your mind. Nobody ought to dare do this on Sunday morning. It's too hard, but you know what? God has been so good. God has been so good. And there's a joy you can feel, a joy that is real, a joy you can find, and this joy is mine. Turn my life around Set my feet up on the solid 
Y'all don't know that, do you? I'm gonna say, God can do anything but fail. He can say, He can heal. This part. He is Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He's the fairest of ten thousand. He can save you from your sin. He can save. but fail. Friend, I can tell you that is a fact. <laughs> His word says he'll never fail. And here's what the Bible says. It says heaven and earth will pass away. But my word will come never on, pass away. On, that's the truth. You better hang on to this, friend. 
If God said it, it'll come to pass. If God's promised you something, it'll come to pass. God's talking to some people in here today. No doubt about it. He's talking to you. I can feel it. And some of you have come here today out of desperation. You're desperate for God. You're desperate for God to help you. Whew, man, I feel that. Whew. Just raise your hands and begin to worship him. Come on. Hallelujah. Man, I feel that. Just worship him. Let the Spirit of God move in this place. Not by might and not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, friends. Lift your voices. Come on. Worship him. Woo. Hallelujah. You're mighty in this house, Lord. Yes, you are. You're mighty in this house, Lord. Ira basure de de bebe ando korean sadara babaya. He ando lo bo she karara mamaya. I ando lo bo koro solo na na mande de de biata. We love you, Jesus. You're so faithful, Lord. You're so faithful, Lord. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah! New things! New things! I tell you what I want everybody to do just for a minute. I want everybody to just to turn, and I want men to turn and pray with a man nearby, and I want ladies to pray with a lady, if you have to cross the aisle. But I want you to keep your eyes open for a minute, and I don't want there to be a person in this house without having somebody have a hand laid on you and praying for you. So I don't want nobody left out. Let's do that right now. A man with a man and a lady with a lady for a minute. I want us to pray. There's people here that, today that needs prayer. Yes, there is. Hallelujah. Find your prayer partner right quick. Come on. Woo. Jesus. Meet the need, Lord. We lose the spirit of faith in this house. Shera babando correre de bebe anso. Yera boso la babo kondo la baboya. Hallelujah. In the powerful name of Jesus. In the powerful name of Jesus. In the powerful name of Jesus. Great is the Lord. Great is the Lord. Great is the Lord. He is the mighty God. Great is the Lord. Hallelujah. Great is the Lord. Great is the Lord. Great is the Lord. Yes. What's the name?
Hallelujah, hallelujah. I tell you, friend, the Spirit of the Lord's in the house today. there a minute ago, the Lord just spoke to my heart. I didn't hear him audibly, but he spoke to my heart. And he said, share with the congregation, tell them that I'm near to them. The Lord says he's near to us today. There's been times the Lord has been so near it felt like if you whispered here, it would boom in heaven. Just, just a whisper. Such an open heaven in this place. You're in the right place, friend. There's wonderful churches all over America, wonderful churches right here in Pensacola. But this is one of those places where there's an open heaven and the Lord is near today. I, I requested a song. I want them to sing this. And... Uh, you're going to feel chill bumps. <laughs> the Lord's going to sweep over this place and he's just going to move. We're going to sing in the presence of Jehovah. Wow. In and out of situations that tug of war at me all day long I struggle for answers that I need, but then I come into your presence, all of my questions become clear, and for this 
I direct better with my head.
Like the presence of the Lord. Have you ever just had a hell, a hell a week, just a week from hell? You ever had one of those? <laughs> I've had one, I think. Uh, I mean, a week from hell. And then you come into the presence of the Lord and you're not there 30 seconds and you forget the week of hell. And just forget it. Just forget it. Oh. It's just like <clears throat> old Job and everything he went through and Joseph, everything he went through in the Old Testament. So many went through things that we read about them and we say, my God, all those years. But they wasn't in heaven 30 seconds and all that was as nothing. Amen? In the presence of Jehovah, everything just changes. God can turn your situation around just like that. It won't take him 15 seconds to do it. Hey, hallelujah. We bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. I got a message this morning that I feel like is so appropriate for the day. I want to bring a message today, and I want you to take your Bibles and remain standing in honor of the reading of the Word. We're so glad to have everybody here today, all of our guests, our visitors, wonderful crowd here for the summer. We've been so blessed to have excellent attendance during the summer months. We have people this morning in overflow also. It's so good to see all of you. It's always good to see you, and it's always good to have you. This coming week, we're going to have a powerful youth conference here. Uh, there's going to be, we've had to turn away, how many, Richard, probably 700 or close to 1,000 people. Uh, we're going to have about 16 to 1,700 youth here this week. We had to turn away probably 700 to 1,000, I would think. And um, <clears throat> then this coming Friday night, on the heels of the youth conference, Claudio Frazen will be here from Argentina. It's going to be a powerful night. We have had several powerful weeks. Week before last, Jensen Franklin was here. He preached an awesome message. Powerful altar call. Um, there's some other things that I'm not able to talk about right now, but we just got some things planned that we know the Lord is in. We've been praying about it. We'll hopefully be able to announce it before too long. I'm hopeful by Labor Day we'll be able to announce something, but I'm excited about it. Last Sunday, uh, last Friday, Tommy Tenney was here. Wonderful, wonderful spirit of God. The presence of God was so strong in this house. Brenda went so deep under the glory. I had a rough time with her getting her home. I remember those days when I was a boy in Pentecost, the power of God coming down. I'm so glad that I just don't have to look back and remember when I was a boy. I'm glad now our children can see what we experienced. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? Everybody needs an experience with God. <clears throat> Salvation, yes, that's what is required for heaven. It's wonderful. It's great. But even after the Lord saves you, and that may be one of your most powerful experiences ever, and that's what it takes to say, that's what it takes to get you to heaven. Don't get me wrong. That's the greatest thing of all is salvation. But there needs to come a place in your life and a time when you have an experience with God that you know, that you know, that you know you had an experience with God. And I remember some of those pivotal moments in my early life. I remember them in the life of my sisters as God touched them. As a matter of fact, today I'm very happy to have my cousin with me, my, my daddy's brother's daughter, and her husband, uh, Faye and Ed Salter. Would you raise your hand up and let everybody see you? There they are right over there. God bless you. I love y'all, man. <laughs> you know what? It's the strangest thing, but last night about 10 minutes after 11, I came that close to calling y'all. About 10 minutes after 11 last night, and I said, well, it's bad manners to call people after 10 o'clock. So I didn't do it, and here you are here today. And I know that... We'll have lunch after the service, okay? God bless you. 
So good to see all of you. Brother Landrum, where are you at? Where's he at? James, where's Brother Landrum at? Where is he at? Hey, man, God bless you. We've been praying for you. Brother Landrum, we love you. I love you, Daddy. I remember your daddy. And your mama's here. We've been praying for you. He's had a bout with cancer. And God's really touched him lately, just really done a powerful work in his life. I remember about a month ago, we was praying for people through here, and the power of God hit him so strong in that pew back there, I thought the pew wouldn't take him. That's what I'm talking about, experiences with God, amen? <clears throat> to this morning, <clears throat> I come to you in a pastoral role, and I want to minister to you. I want to talk to you. I think probably... The role of a pastor on Sunday mornings, especially in a church, should be a lot like a father coming in and talking to the family. That's what I want to do today. I want to minister today a message. Cut me down just a little bit. Help me with these things here. I want to minister today a message entitled, The Arm of the Flesh and the Arm of the Lord. And I want you to turn to Jeremiah, chapter 17 and John and Psalms. And when you sit down and keep your Bible in your lap, you're going to need it. I never have learned yet to preach without a Bible. There's a lot of complaints today about people that say, well, this guy came in and never even cracked his Bible. Friend, we're going to crack our Bibles. There's services where the Spirit of God comes in and takes over like that, and it's not necessary. God's just doing His thing. But, oh, man, I don't know about you, but we have to eat off of this, don't we? Just have to eat off of it. He said, man shall not live by, but... That's right. Jeremiah 17. I'm preaching on the arm of the flesh and the arm of the Lord. Jeremiah 17, verse 5. Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusts in man, and makes flesh his arm, and whose heart departs from the Lord. He shall be like the heath in the desert, and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land and not inhabited. Blessed is the man that trusted in the Lord, whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters that spreads out her roots by the river and shall not see when heat comes, but her leaf shall be green and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Now, John chapter 12. John chapter 12, boy there's so many scriptures I could read this morning, I really just had to snatch a couple here, because if I would have done what I wanted to do when I was making my notes yesterday, I would, I, I would probably had about 14 or 15 texts today, but I just had to snatch a couple and let's get on with it. John chapter 12, verse 38. <clears throat> that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, the Lord, who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Look at it. Lord, who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Now, Psalms 44. I'm going to read verses 1 through 6. <clears throat> Psalms 44, 
Psalms 44, verses 1 through 6. This is talking about Israel. We have heard with our ears, O God, our fathers have told us what work you did in their days in the times of old, how you did drive out the heathen with thy hand and planted them, how you did afflict the people and cast them out. They didn't get the land in possession by their own sword, neither did their own arm save them, but thy right hand and thine arm and the light of thy countenance, because you had favor unto them. David said, Thou art my king, O God. Command deliverances for Jacob. Through thee will we push down our enemies. Through thy name will we tread them under that rise up against us. I will not trust in my bow, neither shall my sword save me. But thou hast saved us from our enemies and has put them to shame that hated us. In God we boast all the day long and praise thy name forever. Selah, hallelujah. Woo. We bless you, Lord. You may be seated. Man, there ain't nothing like the Bible. Shoo. Hallelujah. Y'all feel the anointing in here today? It's hopping. I can feel it. I hope my 25-watt bulb don't blow. <laughs> today I want to talk to you as a pastor, and I want to talk to you like a father, many of you. I want to talk to you today about the arm of the flesh and the arm of the Lord. The Bible speaks of two vastly different arms. They're vastly different. First, the arm of the flesh is our deal. Second, the arm of the Lord is God's deal. One is based on human ideas and effort, and the other is based on God's plan and his power. One is flesh and the other is spirit. Jesus told Nicodemus, he said, that which is born of the flesh is, and that which is born of the spirit, spirit. Now, the first point that I want to bring to your attention this morning is this. Whatever is begun in the flesh must be maintained in the flesh. Amen? Now today while I'm ministering, a lot of you, your mind is going to chase rabbits. Because as we go along here, this is going to touch a lot of people in this place. It's going to touch a, our overflow, people watching by television, listening by radio, those listening by cassettes and videos. As I begin to minister along these lines, you're going to start chasing rabbits because something we're going to say all along through here will spark something in your family, your life, your children, your business, whatever. And I want you to try to corral your mind to stay with this thing as much as possible. I'm going, I'm going to get through it as quickly as I can. This should be just a one-part message today. But this is what's been on my heart now for about several months, and I'm glad I got the opportunity to bring it today. Point number one is, whatever is begun in the flesh must be maintained in the flesh. You don't start something in the flesh and then all of a sudden transfer over in the spirit and expect to get fruit out of something begun in the flesh. On the other hand, whatever is begun in the spirit will be maintained effortlessly by the spirit. So there's two arms. And there's two results. I want everybody to look this way for just for a minute, and I want you to listen to this statement. The arm of the flesh always results in frustration. Yes. Right. 
the arm of the flesh always results in frustration and bewilderment and great stress. Boy, I'm tempted here. I want to jump off track and run, and I can't. So I got to stay with it. The arm of the Lord results in victory and in peace and in lasting fruit. Let me say that again. The arm of the flesh results in frustration, bewilderment, and great stress. The arm of the Lord results in victory and peace. It's hard, friend, to work and carry out things that you've devised in your own mind and you didn't pray about it. It's hard to catch that tiger by the tail once he's out of the gate. <clears throat> when God starts something, he carries it through to completion without struggle on your part. Now that does not mean without attack on your part. The devil's going to attack you. There's a big difference between the devil attacking you and you struggling with something that God didn't start. There is a difference. And I want to tell you, uh, we'll get to some of these other points in just a moment, but let me stay here just for a minute. There is times in your life when no amount of rebuking the devil is going to change anything. If you're in a frustrating situation and it's a, a result, a direct result of something that came about because of the arm of the flesh, you can rebuke the devil until your rebuker wears out. And it ain't going to happen, friend. No amount of rebuking the devil can succeed whenever you're suffering because of the devices of the arm of the flesh. No amount of rebuking the devil. Now, let me talk for a minute about attack. Yes, whenever God is with you, you're going to be attacked. Yes, the godly will suffer persecution. Yes, you're going to have adversity. But I'm trying to help you to understand today and get a, a handle on the difference between endless frustration where you're just frustrated. It's just, it's just frustrating. You're involved in a situation that's endless, just frustrating. Just, it just, oh. There's a difference in that in being persecuted for Christ's sake, and there's a difference in that in being attacked whenever you begin to move forward. Let me just give you one scripture real quick, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Turn to 1 Corinthians 16. I'll, I'll show you just a sample scripture. There's a lot I could turn to, but 1 Corinthians 16. First Corinthians 16 and verse, y'all got it? Verse 9. The apostle said, A great door and an effectual door is opened unto me. And he said, There are many adversaries. You see that? Let's look at this just for a minute. The apostle said, There is a great door. He didn't just say a door. He said, There's a great door. And it's going to be very effectual. In other words, it's going to be very productive opened unto me. In other words, God opened it unto him. Now look this way, everybody. The arm of the Lord opened the door for Paul. And then he said this. He said, but I'm not deceived. There are many adversaries. So there's a difference in this just frustration, just frustration. There's a difference in that, and there's a difference in God opening a door for you by the arm of the Lord, by the right arm of the Lord, strong arm of the Lord. He opens a door. It's a very effectual door. It's going to be very fruitful, very productive in your life, your ministry, your business, whatever. It's open. God opened it for you. You're going to be attacked, but the attack is different from endless frustration. Let me show you something about Jesus. 
Jesus never really spent a lot of time with the devil. Today, I think we spend too much time on the devil. Amen? Whenever Jesus walked into town, they either ran from him or had a little confrontation with him, which didn't last long. He said, hey, out. That was about it. Whenever the Son of God walked into town, demons began to flee. Amen? And yes, I believe in deliverance. And yes, I do know that the demonic powers are strong. And yes, I do know that there's real power in demons and devils. But what I'm saying is when you're moving in the arm of the Spirit, Jesus didn't take a whole lot of time in dealing with Satan. If God is with you, what does the Bible say? Now, what is God being with you? It's the arm of the Lord. It's the arm of the Spirit. God is with you. If God be for me, the arm of the Spirit, who can be against me? You just don't worry. But if God is not with you, and if it wasn't birthed out of the Spirit, and it wasn't right, you've got a lot to be concerned about. Are you listening to me? Yes, you're going to suffer attack. Yes, you're going to suffer demonic onslaught. But if God is with you, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And the Bible said Satan will come at you one way and will flee seven ways. That's what it says. He'll come at you one way, but when he hits you, it means it shatters him and he runs off in seven pieces. When there is a constant struggle in your life, let me just take a little bit of time on this. When there's a constant struggle in your life, sometimes it's a sign to you to stop. It means that you're moving in the arm of the flesh and not in the effortless freedom of the arm of the Spirit. Jesus operated in the arm of the Lord, man, he moved in peace, 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 peace. Jesus was not struggling. He was at peace, man. He was serene. Rumors didn't unsettle him. Plots and conspiracies did not unsettle him. When Jesus came around, the devil trembled, he begged, and he fled. I believe whenever the arm of the Lord is with us and what we're doing is birthed out of the Spirit, I believe that Satan will tremble, beg, and flee like he did when Jesus was here. Amen? Amen. Jesus never moved, wore himself out with struggling. He, he moved in authority. He did not move in one struggle after the other. I, I've got other scriptures here that I need to go to, but I don't want to kill too much time. I want you to, um, let me go on to part two right quick and share this with you, or the second, second point. The first one was whatever is begun in the flesh must be maintained in the flesh. Whatever is begun in the spirit must be maintained in the spirit. The second point I want to bring to your attention is there's a major pitfall in relying on the arm of the flesh, and here's what it is. When you rely on the arm of the flesh, it means that you start lusting for something you, sh you think should be in the plan of God for you. Let me say that again. When you begin to move in the arm of the flesh, what happens is lust takes you over, not sexual lust, not that necessarily, maybe fits in, but that's not really it. But you begin lusting for something that you think God should include in his plan for you. But maybe God did not include that in his plan for you. Maybe you saw it in somebody else. Maybe you saw it in somebody else's business. You saw it in somebody else's church. You saw it in somebody else's ministry. You saw somebody else moving in that. 
and you lusted after it. You wanted it. You wanted that. You wanted what they had. You wanted to be used like they were used. You wanted to go where they went. You wanted the popularity they had. You wanted the money they had. And then all of a sudden, your mind and the heart, being that it's deceptively wicked above all, it has a way of sort of incorporating something and trying to graft it in to the plan of God for you. And the Lord says, no, I don't have that in mind for you. One of the tendencies that I think most Christians fall for, that's a pitfall, is we try to mimic other people. And we try to imitate and we try to have their success. We try to have their results. And God maybe has not even included that in his plan for you. God's got something distinctive, an individual for you. It's his plan, his will. God has a will and a plan for everybody. Do you believe that? And if God's got a will and a plan for everybody, it means that's where your peace is. That's where your rest is. That's where there's rest for your soul. There's rest for your emotions. That's where you can sit down on the bench, on the strong arm of the Lord, and just be blessed, have favor, move in security, move in peace. Because God's got a plan for your personality, for your giftings, and for your family. But when you reach out and you begin to lust after other things that other people have and their results, and you lust after it and you try to make that a part of your portfolio, that's the arm of the flesh and it nullifies the arm of the Lord. A little leaven can leaven the whole lump. And strong desire for what we think would make us happy is a very powerful thing. When a person's not happy, one of the things they're going to do is look around for something they think will make them happy. But I'm telling you, when you start looking around in other directions and you start searching for something you think will make you happy, you better make sure you soak it in prayer because it's going to make you more miserable. Amen? It's like having a sickness and taking the wrong dose of medicine. We're taking matters in our own hands. Oh, listen, if you want to take matters in your own hands, Holy Spirit will not stop you. He won't stop you. He'll let you. You can take minister, uh, matters in your own hands in regard to a ministry. God never called you to. You can try to start moving in giftings that God has never given you. Many try to even move in gifts of the Spirit that, that never was divided severally by the gifts by the Holy Spirit. The Bible says the Holy Spirit divides the gifts severally as He wills. Just because you want to move in prophecy doesn't mean the Holy Spirit has given you the gift of prophecy. And just because you want to move in the gift of of healing does not mean that God has divided the gift of healing to you. Know your giftings and flow in those giftings. And if you ever try to flow outside those giftings, you're never going to move in confidence because it won't be a natural thing. It'll be a forced thing. It can be a position that you want. This one wants that position. This youth pastor wants that position. This worker in the church wants to be an officer. This layman wants to be a deacon or a director. This preacher wants another man's pulpit. This evangelist wants another man's crowd. It can be a rank. It can be a mate. You think she will make you happy. You think he will make you happy. And you're looking and you're lusting. You want the relationship. Oh, if I just had her, if I just had him, how different my life would be. Oh, we could be so happy together. You better wait and let God put you together. I believe there's an Isaac for every Rebecca. I believe there's a Rebecca for every Isaac. 
I believe there's a Brenda for a John. Can you say amen? All right. It can be a mate. It can be a job. Or if I just had that job. Or if I could just leave Pensacola and if I could just move to Flint, Michigan. Scottsdale, Arizona, try that. Honolulu. Yeah. If I just had that job, if I could just make that money, if I could just move up the ladder like he is, he's so happy. Look what he drives. Look where they live. Look at their family. They're happy. They've got money. If I could do that, look how I would be. I know people that's got money that blows their brains out. How many of you are going to ever understand money will not bring you happiness? Money will not bring you happiness. Things will not bring you happiness. Possessions and material goods will not bring you happiness. Only the arm of the Lord can bring you happiness. It could be a relationship. Or if I just had friends like he has friends, or like she has friends, and you try to nuzzle into cliques to be accepted, and you get involved in that clique, and it absolutely ruins your name and your testimony and your influence. It was the arm of the flesh all along. It was something God never prescribed for you. Starting a business with an ungodly business partner, or even a Christian business partner, and that wasn't the will of God for you. You want to get in a mess? Go in business with somebody that you're ill-suited for. And you just don't jump in business with somebody and jump out. There's all kind of red tape that'll just intertwine you. And you'll be caught up in it for a long time. How many of you know it's best to ask of the Lord first? And I want to ask you this question. If you ask of the Lord and God says no, can you take no? Ten people moaned. <laughs> Let me ask you this question. If you ask of the Lord, you know how you can tell when it's lust? Perfunctorily, you say, oh, I better pray about this. But man, it's burning in you. You ever wanted a new car so bad? Or a new house so bad? And they showed you the new house, they showed you the new car, and you really wanted it, and you couldn't really afford it? But you'd already in your mind made plans, we'll do without hamburgers all month to get it. <laughs> we'll save our hamburger money. We won't eat out as much, but we're going to drive that car. You see what I'm saying? But let me pray about it first. No, friend, your mind's made up. Lust has got a hold of you. Amen? Lust has got a hold of you. And you go over here and say, Jesus, what do you think? The Lord says, no. I thought you'd say that. Well, anyway... Hallelujah. And so you go ahead and do it anyway. And I'll get God to bless it later. How many of you knows it don't happen like that? Have you ever heard of lemon, L-E-M-O-N? Change the L to a D. A demon car. Everything goes wrong with it, amen? <laughs> Going in business with a partner, could even be a Christian, could even be somebody in the church with you. But it wasn't a God thing. It wasn't a God thing. It was your thing. It was your arm of the flesh. It was your idea. Your idea. But you're linked up. And then after a while, problems develop. You're linked up. And the Lord wanted to bless you with your own business. The Lord wanted to prosper you, wanted you to be innovative and creative. This other guy's got the brakes on you. Doesn't mean he's a bad man. It just means he's more careful than you are. But he's got the brakes on you. A lot of times you want a girlfriend or a boyfriend that's not the plan of God for you. And the Bible plainly says don't be unequally yoked together. Unequally yoked together has to do with more than just boy and girl relationships. It has to do with business relationships. 
ministry relationships, all kinds of things, unequally yoked together. You know what it means to be unequally yoked? It means both of your necks is in the yoke. If it's a God thing, you move along at the same pace and the wood yoke doesn't rub your neck raw. But if it's the arm of the flesh and you're unequally yoked, the yoke is on both of your necks, this one's going this way, you're going this way, and both your necks stays raw all the time. How many of you knows you can't sleep good with a raw neck? <laughs> Amen? You're talking about sleep. I can't sleep. Look in the mirror at your neck sometimes, spiritually speaking. I want you today, when you get home, look in the mirror like this and say, Honey, is my neck raw? <laughs> and here's what she'll say. I've been trying to tell you that five years. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about lusting for whatever you think will fulfill you and make you happy and secure. Boy, there's people that's left their wife and left their husband. God told me. I found me a new prayer partner. Yeah, among other things. Some of you missed that. Let me say it again. If you rely on the arm of flesh, I want to tell you this in a nutshell, you're going to suffer. Nothing is going to work out right unless it comes from God and it's wrought by the Spirit. Nothing is going to work out. Now, let me stop right here and interject something. I want to make it extremely clear to everybody that I'm not talking about sitting on your duff and saying God's going to give me a job. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about you get out with your own arms and drive your car and with your own right arm fill out the application. <laughs> Amen? You do your part. You do your part. It's just like when God, when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, he said, hey, come out of there. And he came walking out like a mummy. And when he came walking out like a mummy, the Lord said, loose him. You loose him and let him go. God did his part. Man does his part. The Lord gave him life. Man had to cut him free. Jesus didn't go over there with the scissors and cut that stuff off of him. The Lord's not going to fill out your application for you. The Lord's not going to college for you. Amen? You do those things. But when the right arm of the Lord gets involved, he'll take all that and kiss it and bless it, and it'll work out. Amen? Amen. Isaac was God's plan. Ishmael wasn't. You know who Ishmael's idea was? The, Ish the idea of Ishmael was? Sarah. The moral of the story is men. No, I won't say that. <clears throat> Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. Yes, hallelujah. Turn to 1 Corinthians 3. You're with me more than I thought. How many of you, when you get to heaven, you want to hear the Lord say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You want to hear that? How many of you... When you get to heaven, you just got this grandiose vision in your mind of how it's going to be when you make it to glory. I do. I think about it all the time. You know, I, I want to see Jesus. I want to see heaven. I want to see my mama. I want to see my friends. I want to see my pastor. I want to be with the Lord. I want to see the glories of heaven. But somehow, when I get to heaven, I want to get there and feel like that my life however long it's supposed to be, nobody knows. But I want to feel like my life that God gave me on the earth counted for something. That's what I want to feel like. Whenever they roll my casket in here or wherever I'm pastoring one day, they roll my casket in the church and they get up and say those things, I want my life, my block of time that God gave me, I want my life to count for something. How many of you want your life to count? I think one of the deepest yearnings in the hearts of God's people is we want to feel like we counted, we made a difference. Now that brings me to a real important point of the message here. 
I'm still talking about the arm of the flesh and the arm of the spirit. Point number three is this. The arm of the flesh has no rewards. The arm of the flesh has no rewards. Look in Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13. Look in verse 13. The Bible says, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he has built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned up, destroyed, he shall suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet so is by fire. Now let's stay there just for a minute. I want everybody to look at me, listen to me. How discouraging it would be to me to make it to heaven and God put his fire, which is different from fire here. God put his holy fire to my little caravan of works that follows me to heaven, whatever they may be. I have some kind of little package that follows me to heaven called the works of John Kilpatrick. And I get up there, and there's my little package of whatever I've done for God. And the Lord looks at me, and I'm saved. I'm saved by the blood. I made it. But the Lord just... <laughs> How discouraging it would be for me to see 74% of what I call my life <laughs> destroyed. And 26% survived. You know what that would actually be saying? The actual truth would be, John, 26% of your life depended on the arm of the Lord. 76% of your life depended on the arm of the flesh. See what I'm saying? See, this thing carries over, friend. When I was studying yesterday and praying about the message, the Lord said, tell my people that even their very works will manifest whether or not it was the arm of the flesh or if it was wrought by my spirit. Oh, I think I'll be a missionary. Well, I think you better pray. I think I'm going to Africa. I think you better get the mind and the will of God. I think I'm gonna be a pastor. You're going to get a sheep bit. <laughs> Amen. I think I'm going to be an evangelist. You're going to be hungry a lot. Unless God's with you, and unless God builds it, unless God does it, I tell you, friend, you're going to suffer loss. Are you listening to me? Works done by the arm of the flesh has no reward. That's... That's sobering to me. Now, I think we just need to just sort of sit here for a minute in this place and just sort of chew on that for a minute. I'm in no hurry. Let's, let's just think on this for a minute. You know, if you're sitting here today and you're a young person and you really haven't yet depended on the Lord and you haven't yet really sought His face, and you had not got his, his mind and His will and His plan for your life, if you start to work on your life trying to be happy and trying to be successful without getting his plan, his blueprint for your life, and letting the Holy Spirit come and kiss what you're, let him initiate it, let him kiss it and give you favor and bless you, you can live your whole life and wind up at the end of your life and the blessings are just not really there. Oh, there was some accomplishment, and yeah, God was good to you, and he's like any father. Even the prodigal father still blessed the boy and put a ring on his finger and killed a fatted calf, but the boy had still blown his inheritance. You see what I'm saying? And the Bible says when we get to heaven, 
it says that the person is saved by fire. It means you're saved by the blood. You're saved. God saved you. He, he wrote your name in the Lamb's book of life. You're valuable and very treasured by him. You made it. But man, when you look at the block of your life, it's like, man. And you know, today I think a lot of you really need to just slam on the brakes and come to an abrupt halt and take a good look, a good look. And you need to ask some real serious questions. God, are you with me? Lord, I hadn't really sought you like I should have, and I hadn't really got your permission. And Lord, you know, I've been involved in this a long time, and I've been struggling, and I just, I need to ask, are you with me? You need to ask a serious question, am I struggling and frustrated, or am I under satanic attack and God's about to bless me? There's a big chasm between the two of those, big difference. And you need to ask yourself that question, am I struggling and am I frustrated because arm of the flesh, it was all done in the arm of the flesh, or is this attack of the devil? Open doors, great opportunities, and I'm just being attacked by the devil. You need to slam on brakes, friend. And if you're going through prolonged struggle and things are not working out, you just need to slam on the brakes, take a long, hard look, go to the Lord and say, Lord, is my life predicated on the arm of the flesh, or am I really, is this you? I'm trying to save a lot of you some tears and heartbreak. How many of you believe it's possible to live in a perverse, wicked generation and still have the peace and the kiss of God on your life? Amen? Boy, it's so tempting. If you don't pray and you don't seek the face of the Lord about things, my wife and I, whenever we go to make a decision on a house or we go to make a decision on a car or we go to make a decision on whatever decision, when we change churches, this is our fourth church, anytime we ever change churches, it wasn't a matter of getting discouraged and resigning a church. I've been discouraged many times on Monday morning and never resigned. But you have to get the mind and the will of God. And I want to tell you this. Once you know it's the arm of the Lord, no man can talk you out of it. But if you don't know that it's the arm of the Lord, anybody can talk you out of it. You're so double-minded. You say yes in the morning and no in the evening. You say yes at noon and no by sundown. Just like this, your life is just shifty, up and down, in and out. It's because it's the arm of the flesh. When you know God's with you, friend, it's just like if somebody come in here today and said, John Kilpatrick, there's a rumor out you're in adultery. I'm not. You know what I'd do? I'd put my face right in that camera lens. And I'd point my finger and I'd say, Let me get, let's get one thing straight right now. John Kilpatrick is not an adultery. You better get that straight. I'm not an adultery. Whoever got it started better get it straight. But if I was an adultery and they put that camera in my face, I'd cow back. See what I'm saying? I'd cow back. That confidence wouldn't be there. It's the same thing true in our life. If it's the arm of the flesh and it's something you've done, when the pressure's on, you sort of cow back. But boy, if it's the arm of the Lord, and the pressure's on, you can stand up in the face of every devil and say, No! We're going forward in the name of the Lord. Many adversaries, many adversaries, but there's an effectual open door, and bless God, we're going through it. And you know what? You go through it. And you don't lose sleep over it. You just know God's with you. It's like if I decide to leave here and I'm going to, to Washington, D.C., I look at the Rand McNally map, and I say, well, I've got to go up to Flomington, I've got to get on 65, I've got to go through Montgomery, I've got to go up to Atlanta, I've got to go over to the Carolinas, and by the time I get to Washington, every place I get off, every interstate that changes, every road that changes, I'm working toward Washington, D.C. But because I've got my map, and because I know exactly where I'm going, I'm moving with confidence. But if you don't have that map, and you head out, and you say, I'm going to Washington. When do you plan on getting there? I don't know, but I'm going to get there one day. 
and you just take off without your mouth. You know what that's like? That's like the arm of the flesh. You liable to wind up out here somewhere in Alaska. See what I'm saying? You don't know where you're going to wind up. That's the way it is with the arm of the flesh. You just don't know the outcome when you're, when you're dealing with the arm of the flesh. But as long as it's the arm of the spirit, you've got that confidence. You know what we need, friend? We need confidence. Let me close. Well, I can't pass this scripture up. Everybody knows it, but let's, let's go to it right quick. Psalms 127. Psalms 127. Verse 1. Except the Lord build the house. Say it with me. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Everybody say it with me out loud. Except the Lord build the house. And look at this. It says, except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. You know what that's saying? Why have security if the Lord's not watching over it? See what I'm saying? And then it says, it's vain for you to rise up early and to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrow, for the Lord gives his beloved sleep. Except the Lord build the house. I say this, except the Lord build your ministry. Except the Lord build your home. Are you all listening to me? Except the Lord build your home. Except the Lord build your business. You labor in vain, friend. That's what I'm talking about here in the book of Corinthians. You get to heaven, whoosh, the fire of God hits it. And you know what? The word comes to me whenever I see that stuff just disintegrate. Vanity. Vanity. Labored in vain. Vanity. Labored in vain. Solomon was the wisest man besides Christ that ever lived. And his heathen wives so turned him from his God through their idolatry and through that false idolatrous worship. No wonder by the time Solomon got ready to close out his life, God was bringing him to the close of his life. He said, hey, take it from me. It's all vanity. You know why? Because he didn't get permission from God to take all those wives. And they led him astray after the things of their false idolatrous worship. You can be wise in many ways, but be a fool in one major way that can nullify so much of your wisdom. Are you listening to me? Could I stay on that just for a minute? You can be so wise in multiple ways, but be a fool in one way. And where you was a fool in one way, it nullifies so many of the wise ways. Hallelujah. Now, let me close out with this, and I'm going to be brief. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I'd like for you all to pick up a copy of this tape after the service and just keep it in your archives, because one day I think you'll need to listen to it again, not because I preached it, but because I think it'll be good information for you to listen to. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 13. Oh, I've already been there. Well, glory to God. Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. This is a good one here. Out of a bunch that I read, I decided to pick this one. How many of you have finally, like myself, come to a conclusion that there's just not much in the flesh? How many of you have really come to the conclusion that when it comes to the flesh, there's just not that much to it? As a matter of fact, it stinks. How many of you know your flesh stinks? Whew. 
Some of you's got to learn that yet, I see. I saw about 12, 14 hands go up. How many of you knows that the flesh really stinks? How many of you knows there's no good thing in your flesh? Now, I want to close out today, and I want to, um, I'm talking about right now the arm of the Lord, but I want to close out today, and I want to share this scripture in Isaiah, but I'm going to close out about not putting your trust in man, the arm of flesh. Man and man's ideas and man's ways is what is known as the arm of flesh, whether it's yours or somebody else's. Let me say it again. Man and man's ways and man's ideas, man's abilities, is what we're talking about when it comes to the arm of the flesh. It's not the arm of the Lord. And so I really wish I had time today. I don't. I've already gone over right now. But I wanted to talk to you about Joseph. Boy, there's some powerful truths in there about Joseph. Maybe we'll come back to it at a later day. Right now in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 6, look at this scripture. The voice said to Isaiah the prophet, cry. And he said, well, what shall I cry? And the Lord said, cry out, all flesh is grass. And all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. And the Lord said to him, cry out, the grass withers and the flower fades. Because the Spirit of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people is grass. The grass withers. The flower fades. But the word of our God shall stand forever. Amen. 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 Isaiah said, I feel an unction. What he was saying here is, I feel like you want me to say something. What do you want me to say? I've got an unction. And the Lord said to Isaiah, cry out with feeling and tell the people that all flesh is grass and all the goodness of the flesh is like a flower and they just fade away just fade away boy I look sometime at people that dies some of the movie stars and some of the rock stars and you see their obituaries and you see the thing on television about their life and you think, my God, where are they and what do they leave behind? And when it comes to the flesh, it's just like grass. You know, here in, in our area for the last three years, we've had drought. I hadn't had much rain. Just lately, God's kissed us and began to send some rain back. But I remember two summers there, it was so blazing hot and so dry. And you'd see the farmers out on the tractors, and you could just see a cloud of dust behind them. And the lawns, you, they just couldn't get enough water, and the trees couldn't get enough water, and the shrubs. And you look out there at the grass, and the grass, because of no water, it just wilts and dies, man. And whenever you look at the flesh, the flesh is like that. It, Dry grass, they just, ugh. And like a flower that can't get water, it just, it's just gone. It's ugly. And that's what the Bible says your flesh is like. And the arm of the flesh is, is like that. It's just, it's nothing. It's nothing. But boy, there's times it looks so good. That lawn looks so luscious. It's a turf. And there's times those flowers, the sun hits them just right, they're so brilliant, and the bees are pollinating, and he says, oh, wow. But friend, let the heat hit it and see what happens. What I'm telling you about is when the fire of God hits the arm of the Lord, it doesn't go anywhere, it remains. We either spend our lives trying to take care of ourselves or either we relent and repent and allow God to take care of us and put our trust in Him. I want to close. I want you to turn to John chapter 2. And this is my last scripture. John chapter 2.
You know, I just sense that I'm talking to somebody right now watching my television. I want you to put the camera on me for a minute. I sense right now that I'm talking to somebody by television, and I sense real strongly in my spirit that you're struggling, friend. It's a major struggle that you're involved in, and it's been going on for a while. And already, while I've been speaking today, the Lord has already talked to your heart, and you know exactly what to do. And I just wanted to intrude in this moment for a moment, and I just want to say to you, you do what God tells you to do, and don't back up from it, because you'll find peace in obeying the word of the Lord and the voice of the Lord. But if you disregard this, you're going to stay in this arena, and you're going to struggle till the day you die, because it's the arm of the flesh, and you know it. So while I've been speaking, God's spoken to you, and you do what he's told you to do. In John chapter 2, verse 23, I, I want to just take just a moment on this, and I want to show you something. Everybody look at me just for a minute before we do that. Here was Jesus' motto. Jesus loved people. But Jesus did not put his trust in people. You understand that? Now, he trusted people, but he did not put his trust in people. There's a difference. You can trust people. A guy gives me directions down here at the service station, and I trust him that he gave me those right directions. But I'm not going to put my trust in that man. I'm not going to give him the keys to my house if I don't know him. You see what I'm saying? So I trusted him, but I didn't put my trust in him. You follow what I'm saying? The Lord trusts us. He even uses us in the ministry. God trusts us. He loves us. He trusts us. He gives us gifts of the ministry to work the works of, of Christ. He, he does all these things, and it's wonderful. He trusts us, but the Lord does not put his trust in us. I tell you who he put his trust in. He put his trust in the Lord. He put his trust in God. Every moment Jesus got where he could steal away from people, he went up to the mountain to pray. He went up to the mountain to fellowship and commune with the Father. He put his trust in the Lord. You see, when you look at the life of Jesus, he was a life that was truly dedicated to the arm of the Spirit. Now, in John chapter 2, verse 23, it says, Now when he was in Jerusalem, at the Passover, in the feast day, Many believed in his name when they saw the miracles that he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. You see that? Now, I want you to look at me just for a minute. Did the scripture I read to you a while ago out of Zechariah say this? Did it said, the heart is deceitful above all. Who can know it? And the Bible says that flesh is flesh, that which is flesh is flesh, that which is spirit is spirit. Flesh stinks, flesh is like grass, it withers, it disappears, it's not permanent, it's only temporary. And you know what? It's amazing, people can be so stable and so dependable and so trustworthy for 30 years and all of a sudden can have a change in their life and can break your heart. A mother can be a faithful mother and a faithful wife for 12 years. A child, 12 years old, faithful mother and a faithful wife. Something happens. One day she leaves a note, and the father has to raise the child the rest of his life. Trustworthy and dependable for 12 years. One day she's gone. I want to tell you something about human beings. Listen to me. We're all human beings. This one too. But the Bible says that he knows what's in man. And there's a big difference in trusting people and putting your trust in people. One of the things that hurts the work of God more than anything is people have not made that difference in their life, in, in the church. They have put their trust in people. And they wind up getting brokenhearted. Whereas you can trust people and the pain is not as severe. And the Bible says this, 
Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men. And let me say this to you. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, hours, pain, nails in his hand, man, he's bleeding. Well, first of all, while he was still in the garden, he came back and he said, couldn't you guys, man, I'm going to be killed. Couldn't you just watch with me? They're over there snoring, man. Now, you know what many of us would have done right there? We'd have said, oh, that's it. I'm out of here. I'm not going to pay this kind of price for these kind of people. There, you're so weak. You're so undependable. You know why the Lord didn't say that? Because he knew all men. And he knew what was in man. Amen? That's why he told Peter, he said, Peter, I have prayed for you. He said, Satan has desired to sift you as wheat. But he said, I prayed for you. And he said, afterwards, you're going to be strong. And when Jesus is hanging on the cross now, he looks out, and there's his mama, and there's his brothers, and there's some other family members. And he looks out and sees some other people he's done miracles on, I'm sure. But where, oh, where are the disciples? He could have said right there, hey, Lord, Father, stop everything. Knock these centurions down and send some angels and pull all this stuff. Let, let, let's, let's pull the plug on this. I quit. You know why he didn't say that? Because he did not put his trust in man. He trusted man, but he did not put his trust in man. And let me close by saying this. You need to really be careful. You're to honor people. Yes, you're to cherish relationships. And you're to respect people. But you must never put your trust in the arm of flesh. Always keep your trust in the arm of the Lord. And may I say this. Man has failed me miserably. And I'm sure that we have failed people miserably also. There's been times that you have failed people. There's been times that you have failed people, those of you watching by television, and there's been times that people has failed you miserably. You know what that is? That's the arm of flesh. But let me say this. God has never failed you. God has never failed you. You know why most people are so insecure? Is because when you put your trust in the arm of flesh, which is man, and you don't trust the Lord, you never have that sure-footedness about you. But when a person learns to overlook and look past putting their trust in man, and they put their trust in God, there is a surety about them that even Jesus, hanging on the cross and his disciples were all gone, he still was solid as a rock. You know why? Because he was founded in his Father. Only God is perfect, friend. God is good. And all the time, God is good. Would you stand with me, please? You know what I want us to do right now? I want us to be honest for the next few moments. Just stay with me. I want us to be honest. See, I don't want you to come in, friends, and get the word and take the message, and then after you get the message, you say, thank you, and then you hit the doors. See, now, that was God ministering to you, but right now, we're fixing to minister to God because now we're going to bring our gifts to him of repentance. And the Bible talks about gifts meet for repentance. And what we're going to do right now is I want to ask everybody in this room, and I'm not going to take much time with this at all, but I want to ask everybody in this room that would be willing to confess. Brother Kilpatrick, the message touched me this morning. God spoke to me through your message. That's all I'm going to say. We're not going to get into details. But the message touched me this morning, Pastor. God spoke to me through your message. And there are some things that I need to get right with the Lord. I'm talking about Christian or whoever. 
If you're here today and you've been leaning on the arm of flesh and you're going to put the brakes on today, I want you to come right now. It should be about everybody, but I want you to come right now. We're just going to stand here and pray together. I know there's a lot of people here, and I know that there's chairs out. We're not going to move the chairs, but I just want you to stand because we can get more people here if you'll just stand, please, if you don't mind. Thank you. Just stand. Continue to come. share a pitfall with you, friend, while we're all here together and we're all being honest with one another and with God. Let me show you, let me share a pitfall with you. You know, when you start off in the arm of flesh and you didn't depend on the arm of the Lord, you start off in the arm of flesh, you're going to wind up frustrated and you're going to wind up hurt. That's just inevitable. It's going to happen. Great frustration. You're going, people's going to hurt you. And you're just going to be so frustrated. And you'll pray, and the frustration remains. And you'll pray, and God, I just don't understand. I rebuked the devil, and Lord, I prayed, and I've asked you to help me. And still, you just the same situation. There are so many people that have backslid and left Christ because they were too stubborn to face the fact that it was the arm of flesh all along And when God tried to let it die in their life, and the Lord tried to take it out of their life and let it die, they took it to the ICU ward and put it on life support and kept it alive. And it's still alive in your life, and you won't pull the plug on it and let it die, and you're blaming God for not helping you. And the Lord says, I had nothing to do with it in the first place. Sarah said, Abraham... I got an idea. Why don't you go into Hagar? He said, okay. But God said, I never was in that. That was, a, that was your idea. That was not my idea. And to this day, to this day, there's still problems. Yes, God loves Ishmael, and the Lord gave him an inheritance, and the Lord's going to bless him and help him, but that was not in the plan of God. And there's a lot of suffering because of it. And boy, just like an Isaac and Ishmael, the same thing is true in all of our lives. There's times that God tells you something, and it may be 20 years. Let me tell you something about the promises of the Lord. I have prayed about things before, really sincerely prayed about them to God, and talked to Him and just poured my heart out to Him. And I knew when I prayed, I prayed through. By, by praying through, I mean I emptied my soul, and I knew that the heaven was open, and I knew he heard me. It was just a confirmation. I knew he heard me. I prayed about something. When I lived over on the other street here in Pensacola, I prayed about something. One day, so earnestly, and poured my heart out to God. And it took about eight years one day I looked up and there it was, just like I asked the Lord for, just like I asked him. And it was eight years later. But suppose two years down the road, two years is a long time, much less eight years. But suppose two years down the road, I took matters into my own hands, called the arm of the flesh. I wouldn't be near as happy. 
You listening? Mm-hmm. How many of you want to be happy? Learn to rely on the Lord. So here's what I'm saying. Many people are backslid today and have quit church and have quit God because they didn't rightly in their minds figure it out that God wasn't in this thing anyway and he wasn't going to bless it anyway. And so I want to give you a heads up today. If there's something in your life that's not God and it wasn't started right, wasn't started, it wasn't the arm of the Lord, his arm of the flesh, sever it right now. Lay the axe to the root. Save yourself more grief. Just go ahead, lay the axe to the root of it right now. You say, oh, but pastor, that'd be horrible. It'll be horrible if you don't. Just lay the axe to the root. And God will give you wisdom. God will give you wisdom. And the other thing is this. Some of you, by listening to me, that last part of the message especially, it was like a light bulb went on in your heart and in your mind, and you really realize, you know what? Gee whiz. I've been putting my trust in man. I haven't been trusting man. I've been putting my trust in man. And that's why I walk around so heartbroken most of the time. You know what the Lord's saying? You can trust me. You know, the greatest thing you can do is to just totally trust God. That's the truth. Just totally trust Him. Cast your cares on Him. Cast yourself on Him. And just trust Him. That's what He wants you to do. But until you trust the arm of the Lord, and as long as you trust the arm of the flesh and put your confidence and your trust in man, the rest of your days is going to be miserable. You listening to me? Amen. Let's lift our hands up. Let's just let it go right now. Just let it go. Sing it again, Lendl. Just let it go. Come on. Jesus, Jesus. Father, we let go of it today. How I trust you. Arm of the flesh. It sickens us, Lord. It sickens us, Jesus. We turn the loose of it right now. You're talking to us, Lord. Jesus, Jesus. Precious Jesus. Oh, for grace to trust Him more. Lord, we rely on your arm. Where can we run to? Where can we go? Where can we go, Lord? Nowhere. You've been so faithful, Jesus. Lord, I'd like to ask forgiveness on the behalf of every one of us today in this building. Those of us, those that's watching by television or by video, listening by radio. I'd like to ask, Lord, for forgiveness on the behalf of all of us. For blaming you, Lord, for things that you had nothing to do with. We know how that feels, Lord, to be blamed for things in our own lives that we had nothing to do with. Yes, Lord. It feels so unfair. And Lord, we have been so unfair with you, how we have blamed you for things. And we just said, well, Lord, you won't help me. You wasn't in it from the beginning. That which is started in the flesh must be maintained by the flesh. That which is started in the spirit will be maintained by the spirit. And Lord, we ask you to give us wisdom today to walk before we make a step we trust you and we rely on you Lord and we throw our dependence upon you because Lord we don't know and Father we sure don't want to wind up getting to heaven one day and when your fire hits our life walk away barely getting into heaven by the skin of our teeth Lord we don't want that we ask you Lord today to give us repentance that we might truly repent before you, Jesus, and say that we're so sorry, Lord, that we have taken matters in our own hands. It cost us. We should have listened to you in the first place. I'm sure when the prodigal son came back, the, the parable doesn't share it, but I'm sure when the prodigal son came back, he probably many times got with his father and said, Oh, Father, oh, Father, I should have listened. I sh oh, I'm so embarrassed. And Lord, today many of us just feel so embarrassed and so ashamed that we didn't listen to you. 
and we didn't take your counsel and do it right the first time. We ask you, Lord, to forgive us. Would you just ask him right now, right where you are, just ask him, just pray to him for a few minutes here. Ask him to forgive you. Come on, lift your voices. Just ask him to forgive you. Talk to him. Jesus, forgive us, Lord. You know and you see. And we ask you, Jesus, have mercy on us. And Father, we just put the brakes on this thing right now. We lay the ax to the root of it. And we're going to leave this place. We're going to be different. We're going to be different. We're going to consult you. We're going to consult your word. And Father, there's going to be some changes made. Some changes made. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. Trust in the Lord. So we get trust in the Lord. and uh, board members as soon as the folks have returned to their seats. If you will, be seated, please. The elders of the church come forward now. We're going to serve you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Go ahead, Lynn. Bye. 
has spoken to his church today so clearly that is the arm of uh, arm of the Lord to be trusted in the arm of the flesh is to be resisted and rejected I believe one of the reasons Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper was to remind us how much we need him and how dependent we are on him because he said do this in remembrance of me if we ever forget if we ever forget we're in trouble. If you read the history of the children of Israel and if you read the history of the church, you will discover that God is constantly calling us to remember. And the reason he's calling us to remember is we'll resist the temptation to rely upon ourselves. But uh, we'll, we'll understand that our strength and our courage and our power and our relationship is totally, completely dependent upon the arm of the Lord. God wants to strengthen his church this morning. I'm going to ask if you'll stand with me, please, and take the element in your hand. The element of the crucified body 
of Jesus Christ. And the crucifixion, much more happened than just the purchase of our salvation. That was a marvelous thing. But when stripes were laid upon the back of Jesus Christ, it also provided for our healing. And so as you hold this bread today, if you're sick, there's an infirmity that's gripped your body, have good news for you. Thank God for medical science and all of the advances that have been made there. But I have good news for you. When medical science has reached its end, the arm of flesh, when human ingenuity has done all that it can do to develop a cure for your disease and you're still sick I have good news for you today there's a cure there's a cure it's the arm of the Lord it's the stripes that were laid upon the back of Jesus Christ for our healing father I thank you for this bread today it's produced by the labor of man's hand but the miracle is that you caused it to grow and you brought it into a sustenance for us that we may eat it and we may receive strength from it. Father, we don't understand all the mystery there is involved in the eating of this bread and drinking of this juice, but we know that you commanded that we do it in remembrance of you. And we discover that every time we do it, we're strengthened in our inner man. And so, Father, would you bless this food to the nourishment of our inner man today, and would you make us strong as a result of eating this symbol of your crucified body? Would you heal every sick body that's in this room right now? Drive cancer out, Lord. Let heart disease be healed. Clear veins that are, are, are clogged at this particular moment in time. Drive out uh, rheumatoid arthritis and things in people's joints right now, Lord God, and heal for the kingdom of God and the glory of God. Father, make us worthy and make us healthy to strong and strong to serve in your kingdom today. In the name of Jesus, we thank you for this bread and all that it represents in your precious name. Amen. Let us eat together. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We don't need a lot of words to talk about the power of the blood. There was an old hymn that we used to sing, and we've sung for years in the church. There's power, power, wonder-working power in the blood. And it's true. It's the arm of God. That's the power that's in this blood. And so you hold in your hand today a very precious, a precious symbol. It signifies the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed 2,000 years ago. That blood has flowed down through 2,000 centuries and is flowing into this service this morning. And it's able to sustain and strengthen us and wash away every sin of our life. Jesus, we thank you for this blood. We thank you because without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. We thank you because your blood is different than the Old Testament blood sacrifice. That blood was given to cover sin. Your blood was given to wash it away as if we never did it. And we thank you, Lord, today for the innocence that you provided for us. Even though we were guilty, you proclaim us innocent through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And we receive this blood today, Lord. We apply it to our hearts and lives, and we thank you because it is sufficient to keep us clean. So, Father, would you bless us now as we receive this emblem, this symbol of your shed blood, and would you cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us drink together. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Pastor's coming now to give us a blessing before we leave. Would you extend your right hand this way, please? <clears throat> I want to bless you in the name of Jesus. I bless you, Brownsville, for God to give you protection and safety this week. I ask that the Lord protect you as you go and as you come. I ask the Lord to protect you from anything that may be lurking any device, any scheme of the devil to do you harm. I speak that the Lord cover you in the blood, put a wall of fire about you and a canopy of fire over your head. I speak to you that um, robberies not take place on your property, theft not come nigh your dwelling. We speak that whatever is going around in Florida, the Nile virus, whatever, 
I don't care if it touches the whole nation. We speak that it won't touch this place. We speak it in the name of Jesus because we dwell with him that's in the secret place and it shall not come nigh our dwelling. And I bless you from diseases and sicknesses that would attack your body, viruses and germs for the Lord to just keep you I bless you that those that's going to give childbirth this week, that the mother be fine and the baby's going to be fine. We bless you this week in the name of Jesus for God to give peace in your homes, there to be rest, peace, true peace, rest in your homes, fellowship, communion, opening up, sharing, real true communion between husbands and wives and parents and children that this church be blessed with a spirit of peace, that the anointing of God increase in this place, that the glory of the Lord increase in this place. We bless the convention that's about to take place beginning tomorrow night, the youth convention. We speak that those 1,700 youngsters that gather in this place will feel the power of God Almighty, that many will be turned, their lives will be changed and turned. We speak that many will receive a call to the ministry. Many are going to have a life-changing experience. They'll never be the same after this week. We speak that God give an anointing, a special anointing to every speaker, every worker, every volunteer, those that moderate, that God give wisdom, that it come off uneventful without any problems that God's name be glorified and his church be edified. We speak in the name of the Lord that this week when Claudio Frazen comes and that Argentine anointing and the Pensacola anointing merges once again and mixes, that the power will increase and the glory will come in stronger measure than even we can imagine. Oh, Lord, we bless this week in the name of Jesus and we bless this congregation May they go in your love and your peace. Amen. God bless you, Browns. We love you. Morning. Sister Brenda, come on in here. Men of hey, God, Lord. Here. Men of integrity, Father. Father, we bless today, Lord, our pastor, Sister Brenda. Lord, we bless Carrie Robertson and his precious wife. We thank you, Lord, for these men of God, Lord, that you've given to us this precious family. Lord, we bless them today with fresh revelation. Lord, I ask that the windows of heaven would peel open, Lord, and that you would pour out fresh revelation, fresh anointing, Jesus, that will break the bondage, Lord, off of your people. Lord, that when they open their mouth, Lord, that they would be filled with authority, filled with life, filled with words of wisdom, filled, Lord, with hope, Lord, that would be imparted to your people. They might feed your sheep. They might protect them, Lord. Lord, I ask that you would strengthen their hide. Lord, give them a strong backbone. Father, in the name of Jesus, give them eyes to see far beyond, Lord. Vision, anointing, give them the mind of God. Father, we ask your richest blessing upon them, Lord. We ask, Lord, the greatest days ahead. Greatest anointing, Jesus. Shoo, Jesus, greatest anointing ahead, Lord that you might be glorified and lifted up. We bless them today. We submit, we receive from them, Lord, the ministry that you give them. Lord, we'll give you the glory and the praise. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Don't forget tonight at 6 o'clock across the street in the Family Life Center. You don't want to miss that service. Bless you.